Hi, I'm Jonathan Lampel with cgcookie.com and in this video I want to talk about what went into creating this render in Blender and how I'm trying to improve as an artist. Just like with most scenes, I started this one out with a sketch. Literally a stick figure though, nothing pretty or complicated. But it has all the pieces I need to test out my idea. This is another Blender market render, so I get to use any assets from there, within reason, to create an interesting artwork for the big sale that was happening. Once I had a super simple sketch that I thought was interesting, then I started to flesh out the idea in three dimensions with a block out. So no actual modeling yet, just incredibly basic shapes that represent the different pieces in the scene, so I can see how they fit in proportion to each other, and how big they should be, and how spaced apart, and all of that stuff. I'm getting the basics of the composition down first, to see whether or not the idea actually works in 3D, but also so that as I go about starting to detail things, I can do that in relation to all of the other pieces. That way, everything will just naturally fit together. For the character in the scene, I wanted to use the new human generator that had just been added to the Blender market. And you can see here, it took me a second to find out where the IK controls were, and once I had that, then it made a little bit more sense. But I really liked the ease of adding a new character and customizing it a bit, and the rig itself was pretty good, and I liked it overall. But it just didn't feel realistic enough, it still felt kind of clay-ish, and a little bit too much like the Make Human type vibe or the Daz 3D stuff, that all just kind of looks too CG. All of the fast character creation tools tend to have the same sort of issues, but I don't really think it has to do with the character itself. I think the facial features and the hands are all actually really good. And same thing with those other apps too. The problem I think is actually with the clothes and the hair. You can see that the shirt and the pants are just like suctioned to the body, and while they have some wrinkles that make it look a little bit more believable, there's just not enough detail there to make it actually convincing. And same thing for the hair. You can't see it in this shot because I haven't applied the hair system, but the hair particles, they look pretty good, but it just doesn't quite have the complexity that a real person would have. So I'll come back to fix that in a minute, but for now I want to continue on with the scene and add more of the pieces. This is an excellent pack of photo scanned rocks that I found on the Blender Market, and I'm using those to create stepping stones. As you can see, I'm spending a lot of time tweaking the position and rotation of these rocks and making sure that they're placed just right. And I also spent a lot of time on her pose. I'm basing all those decisions on what looks good and interesting compositionally, of course, but also to support the idea and story that I'm trying to create here. So I suppose now would be a good time to fill you in on what that idea is while I'm just moving rocks around until they look okay. The last Blender Market artwork that I made, which by the way you can see the breakdown of that in the description below as well, but that was also based off of a song, and I really enjoyed finding inspiration that way. So I decided to go that route again, and with this one I chose Grapes of Wrath by Weezer because I thought the lyrics were interesting. I had heard a couple people talk about how good it was on a podcast, so I decided to listen to it. And it was pretty upbeat, cheerful, and catchy, but the words were full of tension about the good and bad of losing oneself in entertainment. And you can see the concept get more and more fleshed out as I go, but the idea is that there's this person who's listening to music, whether that's an audiobook or a podcast, but they're getting really caught up in their own reality. I've personally found those sources of entertainment to be incredibly beneficial, and they can really help us forge our own path regardless of whatever mess is going on around us. I'd say the majority of my personal growth is due to listening to people that I'll probably never meet. On the other hand, it's also easy to get sucked into those conspiracy theories or crazy political groups that are borderline cults, to the point where what one sees when they look at the world isn't necessarily what is actually there in reality, and may not be what anybody else is seeing. I'm sure you've probably seen the Social Dilemma documentary on Netflix, and at this point we're all pretty aware of that particular issue when it comes to social media. But even more broadly speaking, what we consume tends to help define how we experience the world. And as a side note here, I'm just using a big cube with a volume scatter shader to simulate the atmosphere and make the faraway cliffs feel really far away. But as you'll see as I continue working on the scene and adding the different objects that contribute to this story, so this person is walking straight off a cliff and onto these magical floating rocks. And it's up to the viewer to decide whether the magical elements in this shot which will end up being everything that's surrounded by a blue magical glow, is actual magic that's been created by her based on whatever she's listening to, and she's actually changing the world around her as she goes. Or, all the elements that appear to be magical are only in her imagination, which would suddenly make this render really scary. 
I definitely don't think that this is an obvious story, and that's probably a good thing because it's for an advertisement, but it at least gave me something interesting to work towards, and something that could guide all of my decisions as I go. I just really liked the idea of creating a picture where the meaning and the emotion of it completely flips depending on somebody's opinion. That definitely fits the overall theme. But to be honest, creating it in that way was mostly for my own personal enjoyment and it made me excited to work on the render. I don't know if it contributed to the end result a whole lot, but I definitely appreciate Jonathan and Matthew at the Blender Market humoring me and allowing me to create whatever I think is interesting. Now back to the technical stuff. You'll remember me talking about how the human that I'd created with the human generator was just a little bit too basic and I wanted more natural complexity. Well, that's where a 3D scan works really well. The downside of a 3D scan, of course, is that there's often a ton of cleanup work that needs to happen. In this particular shot, you'll see me painting on where her skin is and just creating a mask, and I'm going to use that for the subsurface scattering so that she doesn't reflect light like a rock statue. The nice thing is that this scan actually came already rigged, which is really great, and I think that's one of the big pros of the Blender market, is that things are already made for Blender, and I didn't really have to do any importing or anything like that. Though I did find that the rig was a little bit limited, so you'll see me in a second use Auto Rig Pro to kind of redo it and make it more to what I was looking for. I just needed more control over the arms and the hands. I'm pretty sure I've talked about Auto Rig Pro before, so I don't really need to get into it here, but you basically just set up these points and click rig, and it works really well, though I didn't notice at this point that the fingers were slightly off, just like the rotation of the fingers. It's cool that it automatically detects where the fingers are and rigs them for you, so you don't even have to place points for the fingers, it just kind of guesses based on the shape of the mesh, which is awesome. But they were slightly off, and so that will cause problems a little bit later, but I managed just to kind of obscure the issue and hide it, um, which is in true CG fashion. As with usual in these types of static 3D scenes, I'm more concerned about speed than I am about complete accuracy. Yes, it's definitely ideal to do everything perfectly, but not if it makes you miss a deadline. So you have to know where to cut corners, because you'll probably always have to cut some. At least until you get good enough to do everything right on the first try, and I am not there yet. So here I'm just trying to take the new model and match the pose that I had previously, because I really liked that pose, but it's definitely taking some time. Now I'm not worrying too much about how her clothes are bending a little bit incorrectly. You can see the sweatshirt is bulging out a little bit where it should fall straight down due to gravity, but we can fix that a little bit later. Right now I'm mostly just concerned with the overall pose. But it's never good to spend too much time on only one thing and neglect the rest of the scene, so here I'm going around and adding more assets. Here's a really good pair of headphones that I found, and the model is awesome, but it's also incredibly detailed. So I need to go through the blend file and just simplify it a bit, turn the subdiv levels down and all that stuff, and figure out how I'm going to want to get this on her head, because as it is now, they're just not going to fit over top. I thought of doing a simple rig with just a couple bones, but then I realized I didn't really want to weight paint everything and go through all that hassle, so I just decided to make a really dense lattice and deform it like that which made it incredibly easy to get the shape that I want. It's very messy and probably wouldn't work with animation, but again, for a super quick result, this worked well. With the poly count down and it fitted onto her head and parented to the bone so that it rotates correctly, then I was ready to move on to the next piece. I wanted to take a break from working with models, so I went to work on the shader for the glowy effect. The most important object to have it was the rocks, so I tested it on that first. I mostly just used a layer weight node to get that Fresnel, or the glancing angle, and make that a little bit more prominent in the glow, because I still wanted the texture of the rocks to come through. I also worked on incorporating a little bit of the wireframe into the Fresnel. I used this to make it a little bit more holographic and more obvious that these elements are not quite natural like the rest of the scene. The main challenge here is actually to create a glow effect in the middle of daylight, because of course, if you take something that is glowing out in the daylight like a candle, obviously it won't have much of an effect and you won't notice it at all. But of course in this scene, I need it to be obvious, so I have to fine tune exactly what those values should be. I also used this time to fine tune the location and the rotation of these rocks, so that I could get the most out of the glow effect by making sure that a lot of glancing angles are apparent from the camera's perspective. I also wanted there to be a little more glow on the bottom than the top, to make it more obvious that they're floating magically. I then turned that glow effect into a group node, so that I could pass any shader into it and it would apply it, and that way I could not only apply it very easily to all of the other rocks, but so I could also export it from this blend file and append it to another blend file and use it on any object. And speaking of files, you'll notice that I'm working with all of these different elements in their own blend file. 
and not in the larger scene itself. In the larger scene, most things are linked and not appended, so that if I update them in their original blend file, I just need to reload the scene and it'll reload it here. That's actually much easier on memory so that it doesn't bog down my system as I'm working. And keeping things in other collections and keeping those collections off if I don't need to see them also really helps here. That's why we can have all these highly detailed 3D scans and things like that and still work very quickly even on my mediocre graphics card. Now at this point I wanted to make it even more obvious that these rocks are magically floating and are a little bit more holographic in nature. So I created this gradient glow just with a gradient texture in the shader editor and applied them to some pretty basic cubes that fit the shape of the rocks. And that way they almost have a sci-fi energy glow. Even though I want this to be a whimsical fantasy-like scene, I definitely don't mind mixing genres and coming up with ideas that are usually found in other types of art. But as long as I mix them together tastefully, then it should work. And speaking of combining a whole bunch of stuff all in one scene, here's a tiger. This one was already nicely rigged, so I didn't have to do a lot of work. Though the rig wasn't immediately intuitive, so it did take a little bit to figure out. Also, I had to look up a lot of references for how tigers walk because my initial guesses on where he should place the feet were not quite correct. But after a little bit of back and forth, I think I got something that was reasonably natural. I wanted to be extra careful to make sure that it looked like it was just peacefully following behind her rather than crouching up behind her and, you know, stalking its prey because I didn't want it to look like it was trying to eat her. That was definitely not part of the intention. So by keeping its pose nice and loose and relaxed, as well as its head up, then I was able to avoid that. After that, I worked a little bit on the tiger's hair shader because I didn't quite like the one that was in the file. It was pretty good, but not quite what I could get with a principled hair BSDF. So I used one of those instead and plugged in all the appropriate textures. Once I did that, I was able to make it look a lot more fluffy. I also tweaked the hair system just a little bit. I wanted it to look more soft and fluffy than sleek and mean. After that, I applied the same blue glow shader that I'd used on the rocks. I just tweaked it slightly so that it would look better in combination with his fur. It did take a couple tries to get the brightness of the glow to look good in direct sunlight, but once I had that, I was pretty happy with the tiger so far and decided to move on to the next object. And that would be clouds. I imported several open VDB clouds that I had found on the market, but I only decided to use a few of them and just instance them around rather than use a bunch of independent clouds, and that way we wouldn't be using as much memory. But just by rotating them and scaling them differently, then I was able to make them all look pretty different, even though I was only using three individual cloud shapes. I am absolutely excited for Cycles X to bring us faster volumetric rendering, because trying these out and making little changes and waiting for it to re-render, even though it was fairly quick in the viewport, was still a little bit painful. And you can see here that my system would lag every once in a while because these are very high resolution open VDB clouds. And I probably didn't need them to be that high of resolution, but it definitely helped the final result, at least I think. But it would be nice if I was able to preview it a bit faster. You also might have noticed some volume rendering errors in the viewport, but that's actually just because this was an early version of 2.93 alpha months before it was released, and so it was definitely not ready for production yet, but I was using it anyway because that's what Blender fans do, apparently. Only real Blender users use untested software when you're on a deadline. Right, guys? Anyway, to continue with the fanciful, magical theme, I decided to have these glowing castles in the background. I didn't want all of the magical elements to be in the foreground, and the background was looking a little bit too empty. I absolutely loved the shape of these buildings. I thought they were perfect for what I was using them for, but I was really heavily relying on the wireframe and the normals in order to drive the shader. But when I looked at the models, the normals were all messed up, so I had to do a good amount of fixing there. But once I had that, then everything was looking good. I used two entirely different buildings that were not even in the same project file and just smashed them together to make one big castle. Initially, I had the castle over on the left because that was the area that was most empty in the scene. But after trying out a couple different locations, I realized that the negative space over on the left that is kind of leading her off to the screen and emphasizing the floating rocks was really important. So I moved it over to the right and kind of used it to lead the eye from the castle to the tiger to her and back and around again. Next, I decided to add a butterfly to the scene. In the original pose, I had her hand outstretched kind of up in the air as if she was grabbing at something or having something land up there. Um, and it could be a bird, it could be anything, but I decided a giant butterfly with a nice glowing effect on the wings would be a really good way to add that. The model that I got from the market was incredibly detailed with even a hair particle system for the feet, and I definitely didn't need that much detail, so I tried to simplify it as much as possible and take away all the subdiv and stuff like that. It still had a good amount of geometry, but at least it wasn't going to slow down the scene. At this point, I was enjoying adding animals to the scene, and I wanted to continue that trend. 
Though to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what animal this is exactly because the file says it's a buck, but I'm pretty sure those all have forked antlers and not horns that curve forward. And it almost looks like an ibex, but those have horns that point backwards. So I don't really know what this is exactly. Um, but this is actually a little bit dark because I decided that in order to continue the theme that I had going, the background needed to be a little bit ominous. And what better way to do that than uh, a bunch of dead deer? I wanted a bunch of stuff that was really not easily noticeable that you'd really have to look for, but that would really contrast the character's really whimsical pose and the bright cheerful colors and all that stuff, just like the different verses were contrasted in the song. But I really didn't want this to get too dark, so I just laid them down so they kind of blended into the rock and you couldn't really notice them unless you really looked hard. But I also did want there to be a lot of details and it seemed a bit empty over there, so I also added a little skeleton dude. He's just taking a nap though, don't worry. After that, I went back to working with the clouds. I wanted to add some below the canyon to kind of fill up that space and also to show that they're really high off the ground. This took a long time because of how slow the preview rendering was. If it had been faster, then this process would have been a whole lot smoother and probably more enjoyable. But it was still kind of fun because back in my day, we didn't even have open VDB files for Blender and we just had to simulate everything with smoke and that takes a lot longer and is much, much worse. So just being able to just throw this into the scene and move it around until it looks right is just already far, far better than the other workflows. And it also just looks way better than a smoke sim because you can get those really fine tuned details. The next object that I added was the crown and there wasn't a whole lot to do there other than add the glowing shader to what already existed in the file. And I also wanted to make the gemstones look like they were glowing, but having it be a flat color looked kind of boring. So I did kind of an inverse Fresnel and made sure that the uh, outsides were actually glowing less, and that gave it a little bit more of a three-dimensional shape. Even though it's, of course, not technically correct, I thought it looked better. Then when I first imported it into the scene, it was absolutely massive and larger than the entire scene itself. So that's, of course, why we like to use real-world scale whenever possible, and that way all of these various items just fit together naturally without us having to do any guesswork. We can still eyeball it a little bit and make it larger or smaller, but it's at least in the general ballpark right away. You'll also probably notice that when I add any items like this to the character, what I do first is I go to the rest pose for the rig and then parent the object to whatever bone I need to, in this case the head bone, and then I uh, put the rig back into the pose position. That way it just follows along naturally and I can adjust it in relation to the character. But more importantly, if I move the character around or change the head position, then I don't have to mess with anything else. Everything is already still in place. Both of those ideas really came into play when I was adding this phone too. Since it was modeled to the real world scale, I just had to add it to the scene. No extra work at all. So that was great. But it also took some time to actually pose the fingers here. And you can see here, this is where my uh, finger rig that I had mentioned that I'd messed up a little bit previously started to fall apart a bit. But luckily it was at least convincing enough to give a good grip for the phone. I would not have wanted to use this for animation though. And again, that was my fault for not checking the rotation of the fingers after creating the initial rig for Auto Rig Pro before going and generating the entire uh, like user-friendly rig with all of these controls and stuff. So next time I will definitely need to do that. Once the hand pose was solid, it was time to wreck more havoc on the scene and just make the background a little more chaotic because it seemed a little too peaceful. So I thought I'd add this rocket crashing down in the background. Maybe it's being successfully launched into space, we don't really know here, but with this trajectory, that's probably not likely. I think this really helps add to the idea, along with the skeleton and some of the more subtle details, that what she's experiencing is very different than what's going on around her. And that's definitely a big part of the story. The way that I made this rocket trail though, I actually think is pretty interesting because it's something that I couldn't do in previous versions of Blender. So I just created a curve and tapered it to make it you know, a good shape here. Uh, for the rocket trail, but then once I was done, I converted that curve into a mesh and used the mesh to volume modifier and then used a displacement on the mesh itself to kind of warp it a bit and make it not quite so uniform, but that allowed me to get a really nice trail here. And I'm also using some volume textures here to procedurally break that up a bit so it's not quite so thick. So it's going to look nice and cloudy here, but also have a perfect arc. The best part about this is that it requires no particles or anything like that, and it's going to render really fast. I also have a second object with an emission shader, and that makes the fiery, glowy part of the exhaust. Definitely nothing fancy here, just some basic shapes and minor procedural textures. Next, those rocks were looking a little too bare, so I imported some of the grass-walled weed assets and just kind of placed them around the scene with some moss and things like that, 
And I think that really helped give it a little bit more of that natural complexity that you're going to see. So it's not all just flat photo scanned simplified polygons. I really like using the Grasswald Asset Pack because those are complex enough to be interesting, but they're not super high poly to bog the scene down. So it's a really good medium, and the shaders on those are pretty good as well. So that's usually what I go towards. But of course, there's tons of asset packs out there, and a lot of them are pretty good as well. Now that I had pretty much all of the elements that I needed, I went back and fixed the character's clothing. As you can see before, it was kind of moving in a very unnatural way thanks to the rig, and it was kind of following along with the body rather than falling due to gravity. So I tried to fix that up a bit and sharpen things up because, of course, it's a photo scan, so it's not going to be uh, perfect topology here but we can still make it work. And I think just cleaning up some of these edges that were a bit too rounded due to the lower resolution of the scan, just doing that manually with pinch brushes and grab brushes worked pretty well. The next part was the hair, and that was a little tricky because of course the 3D scan just had mesh for the hair. It really didn't look right. That said, it was already the right shape and had a nice color texture to it. So it made for a great base. All I really needed to do was place some particle hair on top of that and that gave the illusion of the whole full head of hair. This is exactly the same thing that I did in my previous render, and it worked out there, so I did it again here. It's pretty quick to add, pretty quick to render, and overall works out well. But of course, this is not going to work well for animation. It pretty much only works for static shots, so it's definitely hacky. So if you have a bunch of scans and you're using them for architecture renders or something like that, or maybe they are animated but they're kind of background characters and it's just too obvious that they're completely made of one solid mesh, then I would definitely recommend giving this technique a try. I think it would work equally well for dogs and cats and things like that, but I haven't really tried that yet so I can't say for sure. Next I went back into the character file itself and started messing with the skin mask that I'd created earlier. I'd used it to place subsurface scattering only on the skin, but I realized that it might be helpful to have some subsurface scattering on the clothes as well, but just a minor amount, and of course it shouldn't scatter to red, it should scatter more to white. But just having that tiny amount of light coming through the clothes definitely helped make it look a bit more realistic. It can't be too soft, but just a touch is nice. There is a chance though that if you do that, then it'll wash out your bump details, so you might want to increase those in proportion or make sure you're using the random walk method. At this point, I was pretty close to my deadline and only had time to make a couple of minor changes. One of those was making the castle in the background a little bit more interesting by adding more colors to the trim, because just one solid color, even with a bit of texture, still looked very boring. A second color for parts of the roof and parts of the trim definitely helped here. And while in this shot it might look like I'm making the contrast between the two very extreme, remember that this is going to be kind of doled down by the atmospheric haze, so the extreme contrast here will actually become a lot more of a subtle difference once we put it into the scene itself. I also experimented with really upping the chaos by making the big cloud in the background actually the result of smoke from a forest fire, by making the cloud a little bit more dense and then putting a bunch of these red lights below, but it just didn't quite work with the rest of the scene and it kind of threw the colors off and I didn't quite like it, but I thought the idea of it definitely fit and it definitely added that, that level of chaos that I was looking for in the background, but again, it didn't quite work and it was a bit too on the nose. So I decided at the end to get rid of it. I did spend a bunch more time though tweaking the shapes and the locations of the clouds just to try to frame the composition as best I could. I wanted there to be enough detail in the clouds to be interesting, but not so much that it screams for attention. Eventually, time was up and it was on to compositing, and in this case, I did that in Photoshop. I did a whole bunch of minor adjustments that are totally cheating, but I thought it made it look better, and of course when you're working with just a still image, you have way more flexibility. There's not really any value of being a 3D purist here and doing everything in 3D, unless of course it's specifically required for your project. As you can see, I really like using the camera raw filter in Photoshop, which is essentially just Lightroom inside of Photoshop. And by messing with the curves and the color temperature and the color balances, then I was able to experiment with a whole bunch of different looks pretty fast. One piece of advice that I got a long time ago that I still find really useful is that when you're working with sliders like this, just push them all the way to the max just to see what happens first. Heading all the way out to the extremes and then dialing it back to make it more subtle is going to make your work a lot more interesting than if you start out right in the middle and just inch it forward and inch it backwards and do these tiny, tiny tweaks. Whether you do that in Photoshop or Blender or Affinity or GIMP or whatever, just try to do something that blasts you outside your comfort zone of what colors you normally use. 
That'll make your work a lot more interesting. All of that said though, when I look back at this piece a couple months later, I'm not entirely happy with my color choices. I think the particular warm hue of the background doesn't quite match the blue and it clashes a little bit, and I think I'll go back and fix that later before I post it to my portfolio. You'll also get a good glimpse here of me totally cheating with the spot healing brush and the smudge tools to fix the glow that didn't quite make it out to his longer whiskers. There are also some other minor sharp white spots where there's a problem with the underlying texture and I didn't really feel like fixing the texture itself, so I just fixed it in post. You'll also see me using the liquify tool to tweak the pose of the character to make it a bit more natural and what I had hoped to get in 3D but didn't quite work out to. Is it recommended to work this way? No, and am I ever going to do this in a tutorial? Definitely not. But when there's a job to be done and it's very specific and I know what the rules and conditions of it are, then anything goes. It's the Wild West out there. It's digital creation anarchy. Here I'm painting on some extra glow for the rocks with a really soft brush, and then I also go through and add some mountains to the background, because while I'm at it, why not? Turns out it does help if they match the lighting in the scene though. They don't really fit right next to the cliffs, as they are obviously very different parts of terrain, but I want them to be extremely far in the background, and by just lowering the opacity here and just blending them with the background a lot, then we get that effect. And with that, I'll call this one finished. I think overall it achieved its goal of attracting people to the Blender Market sale through social media and banner advertisements, and I was really proud of the idea behind the piece, but I think the execution could have been done a little bit better. It just didn't hold attention as much as I had hoped. While a lot of people, including myself, talk about the value of having a good story in your artwork, it doesn't really matter what you have in your head if it doesn't come through in the final result. So while I think having an interesting story here and having an interesting idea definitely helped me to get excited about this piece and helped me tie all these various pieces together into one cohesive whole, I think it was a little bit too abstract and a little bit too conceptual, and I think something that's a little bit more simple and on the nose would be a bit more exciting for next time, and would definitely be a bit more dynamic and grab that attention that we're looking for. So I'll try that next and see what happens. I hope you found this video of the overview process interesting and educational, and hopefully it helps you also see my mistakes as well as I'm working, and that's just something you can't see in a normal tutorial. Though if you're looking for more step-by-step -step and thorough and concise tutorials, we have a lot of that coming soon on cgcookie.com. We already have hundreds of hours of courses on there, but we have a modeling one coming from myself next month, and a really big one from Kent all about creating super realistic portraits only in Blender coming soon, and that's going to be super exciting. So stay tuned, subscribe if you want to be notified of those, and I'll see you in the next one.